And today we're going to talk about um, the spirituality of the child. And I'm going to refer a lot to the work of Dr. Rebecca Nye. And um, Rebecca Nye is, uh, she's actually a clinical psychologist. Um, she's done a lot of research on children's spirituality. Uh, her kind of landmark study was um, with Dr. David Hay in the mid-1990s, and she's actually working to replicate that uh, study today because it's been quite a few years since she originally did the study. Um, but one of the things that she found in her study was that um, children were uh, profoundly and innately spiritual, and they did not connect their spiritual experiences or their God experiences with anything that was happening in church or with anything that was happening in religious education in the schools. Rebecca and I is from England, so they still do uh, religious education in the schools. So there was a real disconnect between children as spiritual beings and children in sort of formal religious settings. Um, I'm just going to, I, we only have an hour, but I wonder if we could just go around the room and say really quickly, your name, what church you're from, and something you liked to play when you were a child. So my name is Amy Crawford, and one of the things that I loved to do when I was a child was to make a hiding place. And this morning when Valerie showed that picture of the cardboard box, I would have turned that into a hiding place. My name's Brian. I'm from St. Philip in Unionville. And um, <coughs> my friends and I always like to play chef. So play chef? Yeah, we're always playing in mud and making oh, pies. And mud stuff. pies, all yeah. right. Great. I'm Nicole. I'm also from St. Philip Summerhill, and I used to love playing hopscotch. Okay, great. <coughs> I'm Naomi, and I'm also from St. Philip Summerhill. And um, my sister and I like to play Barbies. Barbies, great. We're just going around saying who we are, what church we're from, and what we liked to play when we were children. And I'm Kathy Grant. I'm from uh, St. John the Baptist Mothers. And uh, I play Barbies a lot. Barbies? <laughs> okay. I'm Dustin McCray. I'm from St. Andrews in Grimsby. And I used to play hide and seek. Hide and seek. Okay. Very good. I'm, I'm Betty Fink from St. Chad's um, Toronto. And I used to play in the field at the back of our house. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I'm April Lansing. Uh, right now I work with here, but I used to want to grow up here. And I love to swing when I went flying. Okay. Um, my name is Alyssa. Uh, I'm from St. Paul's on the Hill. And uh, I love to play hockey. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Not so much anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks. I'm Kevin Chung. I'm from St. Timothy's in Scarborough. And I used to play a lot of Lego. All right, great. Um, my name is Julie. I'm from Little Trinity Church. Um, I like empty boxes, cardboard okay. boxes, just to make forts. Okay. And also a pillow and a blanket fort. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thanks. I'm Colleen from Church of the Resurrection, and my favorite thing to do was climb trees. All right. Thanks, Colleen. I'm Kim, and I'm also from the Res. Um, I like to play in the sandbox, and I remember like. Sort of okay, all right. I'm Kevin Wall from St. Luke in York. I like play the all kind of chess game with my brother. Okay, okay. I'm Charlotte from St. John's Wood. And um, I really like playing hockey. Okay. Yeah. Um, my name is Jen. I'm from St. Thomas. And I am I was Okay, we're hitting your bike. I'm Jennifer, I'm from St. Andrew Presbyterian, and it's a work from Catholic Journal. Oh, okay. I'm Barbara, and, and I'm from St. Andrew Scarborough, and I like playing, I used to like playing the climbing trees and playing numbers. Okay, great. <laughs>
Okay. 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 And Nancy, I'm from St. Cuthbert's, and I just like to see you playing the score in my brother's race car set. Okay. <laughs> okay. I am Abraham from St. John's, uh, trying to stand up uh, the street as young and steel. Um, my favorite thing to do was play tag on the playground. All right. Okay. Do you want to introduce yourself, Hi, David? Yeah. <laughs> I'm Andrew Shelton, also. I like to play war. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I like to do that exercise because I actually think that uh, our play and our spirituality are often connected. Um, so some of us had an embodied way of playing, some of us had an imaginative way of playing, some of us liked to play with others, some of us were playing more alone. And all of those things can sort of fit into spirituality and what it means to be a, a person of the spirit. I also like to make a connection between ourselves as a child um, as we begin to talk about children's spirituality. Andrew mentioned in the last workshop uh, the poem about the child is the father to the man. And so that child is still within us. So when we're talking about children's spirituality, we're really talking about our own spirituality as well. Now, it can be somewhat difficult to talk about children's spirituality because uh, children don't always have an opportunity to tell us um, about their spiritual sides. They may not have language to tell us. And often we don't take the time to listen to children and to what they're really saying about their spirits. So we often have to listen carefully with a certain ear to know when they're talking about something that has to do with their spiritual being and who they are as, as spiritual people. Um, and we often don't take that time or have that ear for listening. So that's what Rebecca and I really did in her research with children. She went into public schools in England um, and she met with children. She showed them pictures, um, usually of a child, and just asked, what do you think that child is feeling? What's happening in this picture? So she didn't start by talking about God. Uh, she didn't start by talking about church. Some of her children were Christian, some of the children were not, some of the children went to church, some of the ch children didn't. Um, but what she discovered was that um, there was usually a signature language. Uh, so if she heard a certain child begin to speak about something, she kind of knew, oh, okay, we're, we're getting close. We're getting close to something. So we have to kind of listen to children with a special ear uh, to know what it means to be spiritual as a child. Um, we also sort of need to examine our own perspectives on children. Throughout history, uh, perspectives on children have changed greatly. Um, St. Augustine in the f fourth century saw children as corrupted in reason, they were willful, and they needed to be made good. By the 18th century, the philosopher Rousseau said that children were born perfect and innocent, but the world made them evil. So two completely different understandings of children as spiritual beings. In our own um, time today, we often think of children as uh, products. So, you know, it's a child is something that we can mold and fashion to be something <coughs> that we would like them to be. We might think of them as consumers and certainly uh, toy companies and fast food companies and even clothing companies have learned the value of seeing children um, as consumers and in times or in places where, um, you know, uh, what's available to us is limited, we may begin to see children as burdens. And we may even see children in all of these three ways in the church as products, something that we can 
form and maybe we can form them into good moral beings uh, or as consumers that are just coming to consume programs that we offer them or we might see them as burdens. We have strained resources and they become a burden on the system. So we have to examine uh, what it is that we think about children as well as paying attention to children themselves. Um, so I just want to give you a very brief little uh, definition of what I mean when I um, talk about children's spirituality. A very simple definition of children's spirituality for me is uh, children's way of being with God and God's way of being with children. So it's not some big theor theoretical <laughs> concept but it's just children's ways of being with God and God's ways of being with children. Um, so first we're going to look at some of the aspects of children's spirituality as described by Rebecca Nye at, uh, from her research that she did with children in Great Britain. Um, and then we're going to talk about some ways that we can support children's spirituality um, in our in our work with them in churches and in our support of them uh, in families. And some of you have little quote cards that I passed out. These are quotes from children and um, some of them kind of relate to the different aspects of spirituality that you're going to hear me talk about. So I'm going to just briefly describe an aspect of children's spirituality and then if you have a card that you think relates to that aspect, uh, you can read that card. Some, it's not necessarily that one card is specific to one aspect of children's spirituality, um, but we'll hear some words of children mixed in with uh, my words. So children's spirituality is every day. They experience the spiritual world in the midst of everyday life. Um, it is not exclusively about something extraordinary, um, you know, but it's just an everyday component of children's life. It's fundamental and entirely natural to childhood. So it's not something that we as adults are going to pour into children, but it is something that we can enable to shine out. So does someone have a quote that speaks to the everyday nature of children's? John, age six. With my mind and with my eyes is how I see God. Sometimes I feel, hmm. I am in a place with God in heaven and I'm talking to him. And um, there's room for all of us in God. He's God. Well. He's in all of us. He's everything that's around us. He's that microphone. He's that book. He's even, he's sticks, he's paint. He's everything around us. By the way, have you seen Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom? <laughs> okay, thank you. So God is just everywhere. Sticks, paint, a book, everything, every everyday thing is a way to, for a child to see God. Um, children's spirituality is integrated. So children experience spirituality as a part of all that they do and all that they are. Their spirituality isn't compartmentalized. A child doesn't say, I'm going to go practice a spiritual discipline now. Um, I'm going to go to church now and be spiritual. Um, it's just connected to how they understand themselves. So does someone have a quote from a child that might speak to this sort of integrated uh, capacity of children and their spirituality? This sort of part of every... Just kind of. Okay. Um, I pray every night at my bedside, but none of my family know what I do. My brother would laugh at me if he, find, if he found out. It's really important to pray. Sometimes I do it at night or in the morning. I think prayer makes me a much better person. Okay. 
Yeah. There's another story in the bottom part that we kind of read. Sure, go ahead and read that part. Adults never really listen to children. If they do, they usually laugh. Every child interviewed. Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute too, yeah, because that's a really important part. So, children's spirituality is integrated. It's just entirely natural to who they are. Children's spirituality is also erratic. So they, they actually have the capacity to leap from very profound, abstract concepts to normal, everyday topics within one conversation or in the course of a day. Um, sometimes we think that children can't be abstract. We think that they're only concrete thinkers. Um, but children actually are more able to understand the abstract than we may give them credit. Does anyone have a quote from a child that may speak to them uh, being somewhat erratic in their... Actually, the one um, that you read earlier where he's got his sticks and paints and then... Oh, by the way, <laughs> have you seen Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom? There's a little bit of erratic in there. Does anybody else have anything that might s exemplify that the switch from one way of thinking to another? I think this might be it. Um, there's a tree I love to climb. I love to climb up to a hole in the trunk to get inside. It starts inside. I put canes inside to make a floor. It's like being in the Empire State Building. You can see for miles. I like it especially when it's snowing. I think about God when I'm in the hole in the tree. I feel close to God because I'm up in the tree. I think of God when I see the sky. He's all around us, actually. He sort of splits himself in half. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> kind of obtuse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, certainly some sort of abstract ways of conceptualizing God, not necessarily, um, you know, a necessarily a concrete understanding of who God is or what God might be like. Um, Rebecca and I talks about children's spirituality as being verbal and non-verbal. Now, if you think about children, they are actually naturally multilingual. Children learn a language to speak at school. They learn a language to speak at home. They might learn a language for their favorite video or online game that they play. Uh, they might have a language of a television show or a movie that they're able to sort of repeat. Um, and as I said earlier, Rebecca and I found that individuals have a sort of signature language when they begin to uh, examine their spirituality. So some of us might come at God through uh, our understanding of nature. Some of us might come at God through our relationships with people. Uh, some of us might come at God when we're being completely imaginative and creative all on our own. Um, but typically, we each sort of have our own language for talking about our experiences of God. And children have their own language, too. And children are able to make connections with God on a nonverbal plane, which may be something that they are able to bring to adults. We often want to put a lot of language around who God is and what God does, um, but children may be able to show us a sort of nonverbal way of knowing about God, a nonverbal way of being spiritual. Um, does someone have a card that might speak to a sort of nonverbal? God is everywhere, Chloe, age 10. God is the flow of the wind. God is the beauty of the sunset, the wave of the sea. He is the scent of every flower, the brightness of the ocean. God is the highest of the sky. God is the lowest of the ground. He is inside every house, the air that no one sees. God is in our minds. God is in our favorite places. God is everywhere. Okay. Did you have one? The phrase God sets your Santos age free. God is in love because his love is good. God is in me because me is good. God is in the underground because there is love. God is in the tree because the tree have 
in me. Lord is in my heart because the heart is good. Lord is all around because all around is good. Lord is in my love because my love is all around. God is in the animals I love because all love is good. God is in the best of friends. God is in the heart of my heart. God is everywhere. Okay. Thank you. There's some, uh, yeah, there's some beautiful uh, quotes from children, and some of them are quite young children, too. Uh, another aspect of children's spirituality is that uh, it's deep, and it may hold some surprise and some challenge for us as adults. Um, so, again, chil we may think of children as being very concrete and literal thinkers that can't handle abstractions. But we may be challenged by what children have to say um, and their ways of expressing their spirituality. Um, they may be able to make some really insightful connections about their lives that um, goes beyond our imagining for children. Does someone have a card that might hold some depth, surprise, or challenge for us? Mine is God Isn't Everywhere by Adana Powell, age 11. God is an illusion, and just in people's minds, I think that their imaginations are really running wild. I think the science is perfectly true. I believe we are all evolved, every creature including me and you. God is non-existent and not at all around. I don't think he exists not on land, in the sky, or underground. Science can almost prove that he isn't there. And when people go to church, they are praying to pure, thin air. God isn't everywhere. And how old is that child? Age 11. Age 11. So there's a lot of uh, challenge there, and actually a lot of depth to it. Um, that child has obviously done a lot of thinking about what God is not and what God doesn't do. Um, and, and that can be challenging for us to meet a child like that. That quote also might uh, relate to the next aspect of children's uh, spirituality, which is that it is endangered. Um, children long for and rarely have a safe place um, where they can examine, talk about um, their spirituality and their experiences of spirituality. And often uh, when they do share something, they might be belittled or laughed at or just simply not believed. And so what often happens over time is that children begin to hide or ignore their spirituality. And in her research, uh, Dr. Nye found that at about age nine, um, if a child hasn't had opportunities to express the spiritual side of them or if they've been laughed at uh, or not believed when they've talked about a spiritual experience, by about age nine is when they start to sort of put the lid on their spiritual um, the spiritual side of their being. Um, I, I think the card you had, that last part, it said that, um, re just read that last line. Adults never really listen to children, and if they do, they usually laugh. Yeah. And, and every child that, that uh, she spoke with, um, when she was done with her research, and she only met with the children, I think, two or three times. Um, but to a child, when she said, this is the last time that we're going to meet, this is the last time we're going to talk about these things, every child said, but who am I going to talk about this with? And so she, she said, well, you might talk to your parents, or you might, you know, she knew they were part of a church uh, setting or a faith community. You might talk to your priest or your minister, or you could talk to your religious education instructor at the school. And every child just said, but they don't, they don't listen to us. They just, they just want to talk to us. They just would laugh at us. And I often think of um, children's time in church that some of us have experienced where a child 
says something and the people that are sitting around them laugh. And the child may actually be expressing something that's deeply important and spiritual for them and they get laughed at. And so even in church, it happens that, you know, we are putting uh, the lid on their spiritual capacity. Any questions about these? Go ahead. I was just going to comment. I think that comes as a death surprising challenge yes. for us. Yeah. Because that's, surpri that's surprising for me to hear as, a, as someone who kind of mentors these, these young children um, and just kind of reflect back. As to if a child's ever shared anything with me, if I've ever laughed or put them down on it. Mm -hmm. I, I think I think part of the problem is that adults understand the difference between an enjoyment laugh yeah. and, and a making fun of laugh, and yeah. children don't understand the difference. I've experienced it with my own daughter. Why are you laughing at me? Well, I'm not laughing at you. I'm enjoying what you just said because mm -hmm. it brings me joy. But she hears. I'm embarrassing you, or look at the put down here. She doesn't, mm -hmm. she can't separate the two kinds of laughter. Yeah. So, and I think oftentimes when the congregations laugh at the child, they're laughing because they enjoy yeah. the simplicity of it, or it's just, it brings them joy, not because they're making fun yeah. of But children can't separate the kinds yeah. of laughter. I think sometimes uh, we laugh too when something makes us uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. yeah. And sometimes children say something that's, that's mm -hmm. deeply profound, but it kind of makes us uncomfortable. And so we sort of have this nervous <laughs> laughter. Did somebody else want to say something? Okay. Any other thoughts about, was, were there any other quote cards that didn't get read? Did they all get read out? You have one? Okay, go ahead and read yours. Um, I wonder what you might bring to put alongside this picture. And it's a picture of Mary, Joseph, and the Christ child, which has been the focus of the story verse of a series telling the story of Jesus and um, one child motions to the sunlight falling on the floor, one child frantically um, frantically gesticulates to a statue of an angel fixed to the wall, that one child points to a banner with a picture of Mary, one arm stretches out to the banner and the other to the picture, she stays like that for some considerable time, a child rushes to an art trolley and quickly draws a bird then realizes she has been sitting on a kneeler with the same image. And the Holy Spirit, she says enthusiastically, other children bring figures from the nativity set. And these are examples from godly play practice. Right. So that could be um, the sort of nonverbal expression as well, where the children are pointing or they're making connections to something else in a room that says something. Any other questions? We're going to kind of leave these aspects and then talk about how some ways that we can support uh, children's spirituality. I have a question because we want to encourage children's spirituality but we also want to direct it and we do want to shape it, I think. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, I think that um, part of it is, uh, and, and we'll, we'll talk about this uh, uh, in the next sort of segment, is that in some ways we have to trust the child and we have to trust God's own actions with the child. That it's not always up to us to, uh, you know, in a one hour session on Sunday morning <laughs> to steer a child away from sort of a way of understanding God to another way of understanding God, um, that we can give them space uh, and time uh, and the, the awareness that, that God is continuing, continuing to work in that child's life. And that it, it, as our relationship with them continues, they'll, they'll begin to think in other, other ways. So. You, tell the, you tell the story. Mm -hmm. Our story, so... The story of the great family that God would play um, is 
Abraham and Sarah, and it kind of juxtaposes that that in, that in Ur, where Abraham and Sarah started out. The people thought that all things were God. But what Abraham and Sarah discovered was that all of God is everywhere, which is different. But that's sort of the Christian perspective. Not that all things are God, but that you can find God everywhere. So if the children are hearing the stories over and over again, that can help the user to sort of form or direct or whatever. But let the story do it rather than you do it. That's helpful, thanks. Um, so all of us, no matter our age, are actually... Um, we have these existential boundaries that frame our lives, uh, sometimes called existential dilemmas. The boundaries that are just part of who it, what it means to be human, whether we're two or we're 22, we're 52, or we're 102. We're all thinking about uh, these, um, these boundaries or these great questions of life. Um, and if you have ever done spiritual direction, um, you will likely find these themes appearing over and over again in the spiritual work that a spiritual director would ask you to do. So the idea of aloneness, that we are born into this world alone, even if we're born a twin or a multiple, nobody knows except for me what it means to live inside my skin. And yet children know without being told that they depend on relationships to survive. So there's that dilemma of I'm alone and yet I need and I am in relationships. Uh, the dilemma of freedom. What does it mean to be truly free? When the people of God left slavery in Egypt and they got out into the desert and they were free, but they didn't know what to do with that freedom and they wanted to go back into slavery because at least there they sort of knew what to expect and they had rules. So what does it mean to be truly free? Does it mean we just get to do whatever we want? Um, and at different points in our lives, we may sort of bump up against the lack of freedom, that no, you can't, because I said so sort of experience. Uh, we might bump up against the threat of freedom, uh, which might sound like, if you don't stop doing that, we are going to leave. <laughs> or that, uh, that joy of freedom, that sort of, that sound of, uh, it's a snow day, <laughs> you don't have to do anything. Go out and play, do whatever you want. Uh, the, the dilemma of meaning, uh, the boundary of meaning. Who am I? Where did I come from? That's a, ch a child's question. Why am I here? What am I meant to do? What should I do now? Uh, what does all of this really mean? And then the ultimate sort of boundary, the ultimate unknown that we all face, which is death. What happens when our time on this earth is over? And if you're around children, you will hear them struggling with all of these things uh, in all that they do. They wonder what happens after after they die. They wonder why they can't do something. Uh, they wonder, you know, why do I have to play with this person? Why do I have to do what you say? Um, so what can we give to help nurture uh, the spiritual lives of children and help them deal with these existential dilemmas that face all of us? And a lot of this comes uh, from a, a, a book that Rebecca and I wrote, Children's Spirituality, What It Is and Why It Matters. And in this book, she uses um, the word spirit as an acronym to talk about um, some things to uh, develop a framework of support for children's spirituality. So the S in spirit is for space. The P is for process, the I is for imagination, 
the R is for relationship, the next I is for intimacy, and the T is for trust. And I'm going to give you a brief view of each of those things. And I do have this on a handout that I'll give you, so you don't have to worry too much about writing it all down really quickly. Um, so the S in spirit uh, is talking about space. I'm just checking my time. Um, and there are three different types of space that Rebecca and I talks about. She talks about physical space and that physical space matters. If you walk into a room, you are immediately going to get a sense of what you get to do in this room, what this room is used for, and you may get a sense of what this room uh, says about me as a, as a person. Um, so you might just think about the space that your children come to on a Sunday morning. Um, if you were going to describe that space, or if you, you know, were going to ask a child to describe that space, what might they say? And would any of their descriptions uh, relate to how you would want them to feel about God? You know, if they walk into a space that looks very untidy or busy, or <laughs> maybe it looks drab and dull. All of those things may tell them something about what's going to happen here and what, and what God is like. If they go into a space that's just, you know, this huge empty hall, it's probably going to say to me, run, <laughs> play, you know, jump around. And that may or may not be the thing that, that you want them to do. So physical space matters. So we need to offer a sense that God is here. Um, and remember that children are sensitive to the feel of a place. She also talks about the importance of emotional space, uh, that children need a space to be a part, a, a space to think their own thoughts, uh, they need space to have different opinions, uh, perhaps from each other and perhaps from you. Um, but they also need to feel like it's safe to have difference of opinions or to feel different emotions um, from what others feel. Um, auditory space is the third kind of space that she talks about. Uh, so a space where Someone talks less <laughs> and listens more. Um, so sometimes we need to leave gaps for children to offer their contributions, their wonderings, uh, their opinions and ideas. So a space for silence can be very powerful for children. And they may not necessarily have the, that kind of space offered to them very often. If you were going to say a word about the space that you offer to children at church, what might that word be? Just shout it out. Last minute. Last minute. Okay. Find a space for something else. So it's space and sort of unprepared. Yeah, unprepared. And, and that, may, that may say, we don't really value you enough to take time to get ready. Other things? I'm very tired. Tired. Okay. What the bishop said was moldy, yucky <laughs> basements. Okay. Okay. Boring. Boring. Okay. Soft. Soft. Okay. That's for like little kids, toddlers. Okay. Okay. All right. Anyway, try to go into your space and try to look at it with fresh eyes. Try to get down on a child's level and uh, see what, what are they seeing. I, I'm constantly on the floor in our space, and I get so upset because it's dirty. <laughs> you know? and I just think, adults will walk in here and they, don't, they, they never look down, so they don't really notice if there's stuff on the carpet, but I notice. So think about your space. Uh, the P is for process, um, and this is an interesting one, and I think something uh, that we maybe we all might struggle with a bit, uh, especially in this day and age. 
but she talks about spirituality is more about process than about product. Um, and when product gets uh, stressed, spirituality may get lost. So when our emphasis is on getting that nose on the lion in the perfect place, or making that craft look like whatever it's supposed to look like, uh, that's all about the product and not about the process. If you look at that picture, uh, that little baby is completely engaged in the process of making that finger painting. I'm sure that the painting has not survived because it probably just turned it to this gooey mess. But, you know, that, that's engagement in process. That's deep engagement. Um, product, being product focused, and, you know, sometimes we're product focused because we're uh, we're trying to get ready for the pageant. We've got to learn these songs and we've got to, you know, figure out where everybody's going to stand. And, um, you know, we may need to have a product. So it's not always bad to focus on product, but we do need to give time for process as well. And if we're constantly focusing on a product, um, then we're saying that basically there's an end. There's something that's final to what we're doing. And when we think about spirituality, I would hope that we're trying to help children understand that our spiritual journey never ends. <laughs> we never get to this final product where, ah, I'm spiritual now. I don't have to worry about it anymore. Thank goodness. Um, but I think we have emphasized that a lot with children, and it may even be that confirmation <laughs> emphasizes, uh, okay, I've completed all my tasks, I learned uh, the rules, and now I'm done. And um, so if we're emphasizing product over process, then uh, we're probably uh, not helping children's spirituality. Uh, pace is important, and uh, we do, if, if we are focusing on product, uh, offer, just let children know, for now, it is all about the product. And we may also want to allow children, whatever it is that they work on, that it gets to be private. So even if we're uh, offering children a wide range of activities and a wide range of ways to engage a, a story, um, don't, we don't always need to ask them, what, what, oh, tell me about that. Uh, tell me what you're doing. Show me what you made. <coughs> it may be that it's actually quite private for the child. And, and the process that they went through to get there might have been really more important to them than how it turned out. And how it turned out might be even somewhat disappointing to them. So if we focus on the end product, it really limits the their own spiritual growth. So the I, the imagination part, a, a child was uh, invited to draw a picture of an angel and uh, that is what a child drew in thinking about an, uh, an angel. Um, sometimes we have a fear of imagination in our uh, faith formation or our religious education because we do think we want some right answers. We need to teach them some specific things. And we try to teach religion kind of like we teach math, you know. One plus one, oh, well, in the church, actually it equals three. Uh, comes out to the Trinity. Um, so it doesn't always work. Um, and um, as we mentioned, as was mentioned this morning, sometimes it's the adults who get to be imaginative in uh, religious education or faith formation. We get to plan all these cool things and then we invite children to come in and do what we uh, tell them to do. And we don't leave them room to be imaginative. Um, but children are actually, I mean, their imaginations are <laughs> quite agile and uh, prolific. Um, but so we need to give them opportunities to express their imaginations. Um, relationship. Um, spirituality is private. It's something that's between God and an individual. Um, but it's also very relational. Um, 
God is this mystery of relationship. Uh, God is Father, God is Creator, God is Son, God is Redeemer, God is Spirit, God is Sustainer. God, our understanding of God is completely relational. Um, so we need to value relationship um, in our work with children. And um, oftentimes uh, in church, we have one person who's there one week and somebody else is there the next week and maybe somebody's on for two weeks but then they're away for six weeks. And so it's really hard to build a sense of relationship with the children. Um, this morning I was listening to um, Fresh Air with Mary Ito on CBC and she was inviting people to, I don't even know what the theme was, I just listened to a little part of it, but inviting people to give their advice on raising children. And uh, one person she talked to said, um, I treat my children with respect and I um, treat them with the same amount of respect that I would treat you or that I would treat somebody that I meet on the street. And sometimes I, you know, hear a child in the store saying, mom, 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 mom. And the mother turns around and says, what do you want? Can't you see I'm busy? You know, and you would never think of doing that <laughs> to an adult or to a stranger, you know, who was trying to get your attention. So um, think about your relationship with children. Um, and relationships respect and they value the other's perspective. So if we can constantly be trying to respect the child and value their perspective, which may be quite different from our own. Um, rewarding children for giving the right answer just really doesn't work when it comes to spirituality or faith formation. The way I am a spiritual being may not work with the way you are a spiritual being. So we really need to give some respect and allow for that space between us. Andrew and I were watching a, a movie last night that's a few years old now called, what, Before the Sunset? Sunrise? What was it? I think that's before Sunrise? Uh, before Sunrise. Right. So we watched Before Sunrise, and there was one point where she was talking about, um, uh, the woman was talking to the man about, I think that if there's anything spiritual, it's about what's happening right now between the two of us. It's that space between us. So I'm still a person here, you're still a person here, but there's something between us that's that's our relationship, and that's highly spiritual. Um, we also need to leave uh, space for debate, despair, indignation <laughs> uh, in our children's ministry. Um, it's not just about niceness or morality, as Valerie said earlier. Um, I'm running out of time here, I can tell. The I is for intimacy. Um, so spirituality uh, relies on coming closer. Our spiritual work is all about coming closer to God, coming closer to who we are as real, real beings. Oh, did you want to talk too? Yes. Um, so we need time to uh, come closer, to delve deeper, to take risks, to pursue our passions. That's what intimacy is all about. Um, and there are many barrier, barriers to intimacy in our children's ministry. Some may be that children don't come very often, so it's very hard to build a sense of intimacy. That constantly revolving um, set of leaders with different styles and expectations, the fear of having to have a right answer. Um, another thing that can break intimacy is um, a feeling that of, of mood. Like if, we, if children come in and it, it's always got to be fun, 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 happy, happy, clappy. Um, you know, sometimes 
that's just not where they are in their spiritual journey. And, you know, they're feeling sad and they're feeling worried. Um, and, you know, we, they come to us and all we've got is, you know, let's be happy and let's have fun. That just doesn't cut it. So intimacy is slowly achieved and quickly broken. And the final uh, aspect is trust. Um, I just look at that little bird in her hands <laughs> and think about oh, <laughs> that sense of trust. Um, so it's, uh, trust is essential to spiritual life. Um, we have to be comfortable with different ways of knowing and not knowing. Um, and trust can be undermined by too controlling a role. So the most important point of this lesson is whatever. Or it's silly to feel sad. Um, Dr. Nye also talks about um, a lack of trust can also be uh, implied by the use of things such as puppets or talking vegetables. Um, are we really trusting the, the, you know, our tradition and the deep meaning of our stories when we turn them over to puppets and vegetables? Um, we also need to learn to trust children and to trust that they can support one another and that they can uh, have a strong relationship with God. And we also have to trust, to trust God. It's not all on us. Um, that part of what we're doing when we allow God to work on the child is saying we actually trust um, the child and we trust God. I'm going to give you um, a handout that has these sort of six uh, aspect or the six criteria of supporting the spirit and I really encourage you to on the back there's a, a process that you can use to kind of delve into those um, with your team at home so I really encourage you to just you know spend half an hour or an hour and look through those Look through those uh, criteria, that framework of spirit, and then go to the questions on the back and really focus in um, on those different criteria and think about, gee, how well are we, are we supporting children's spiritual spirituality? We might be letting them learn something that goes into their heads. But are we really connecting what we're doing with who they are as spiritual beings? Thank you. <laughs>